Barb. Um, hello, everyone. I am Steph Ligori, as Charlie said. I'm with the National Park Service for the North Country Trail. Um, and thank you to the Superior Shoreline Chapter for organizing this with me. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you tonight about the piping plover and the habitats that are near the trail that it calls its home. Um, I am the compliance uh, specialist with the Park Service North Country Trail. Um, for your awareness, we are recording tonight's session. There is gonna be a Q&A at the end and I'm gonna turn off the recording at the end so this way you can freely ask questions. So uh, tonight's presentation does focus on the piping plover, which is a threatened and endangered migratory shore shoreboard that has habitat on Great Lakes shorelines, as well as certain inland water bodies in North Dakota. Uh, but the overall purpose of tonight is to educate and inform you about the protected species and their habitats that have the potential to be on or near the NCT. Uh, you're not expected to be an expert on the piping plover by the end, nor are you ever expected to be an expert on this subject, but um, I hope it does give you a little bit of background knowledge so you feel more informed about how protected species and the piping plover intersect with the North Country Trail. And mostly I, I just hope that you find this interesting, fun, and enjoyable, and that you learn something new. Um, I also hope this empowers you to conserve and protect imperiled species that could have a potential to be impacted by trail work. Uh, we'll talk about how trail work could potentially impact the piping plover, as well as some of the conservation measures that you could implement to aid in their continued existence. And then finally, we will close it out with the Q&A for any questions, um, but the Q&A is not the only time for you to ask questions or ask more about the piping plover. And I hope this encourages uh, open and continuing dialogue um, between volunteers, NCTA and the MPS regarding the conservation of piping plover and other protected species. So I did just wanna start with some uh, definitions of some of the terms I'll be using tonight. First on this list, I have endangered an endangered species is defined as any species that is in danger of extinction in the foreseeable future. That might be because of massive habitat loss, uh, population declines, or any other number of reasons. Um, and then a threatened species is a species that is likely to become in danger of extinction or likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future. So they're not endangered yet, but they're likely to get there one day if they continue their decline. I'm also gonna use the more encapsulating term of protected. Um, not all protected species are threatened or endangered. Um, so it might include those that are protected for other reasons. Um, if it's not threatened or endangered, it might be protected because it has potential to become threatened. Um, it might have a relative rareness or um, their population declines are concerning in some way, um, or they want to, uh, regulatory agencies want to prevent the species from backsliding into previously low population numbers. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna chat about piping plover critical habitat and critical habitats are uh, specific designated habitat areas that are considered essential for the conservation and management of a threatened and endangered species. Um, I'd also like to give just uh, a one slide, a little bit of background on the legislative and regulatory side of protecting species since it lays the groundwork um, and the guidelines for why and how threatened and endangered species are protected today. So throughout uh, the 20th century, there were several laws, treaties, programs that were implemented to respond to uh, flora and fauna that were undergoing serious population declines or they were going extinct, primarily due to human-related um, activities and impacts. But um, all of those laws and programs were not enough and the species were continuing to decline. So in 1973, the Endangered Species Act was enacted to really define and strengthen uh, the protection and conservation of imperiled species. The Endangered Species Act is considered to be the landmark law in protecting threatened and endangered species, and it does provide um, a generally broad framework for facilitating their conservation. Um, under this act, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries do share responsibility 
for implementing the act. Um, however, NOAA generally maintains responsibility for marine species. So for our purposes, the Fish and Wildlife Service is the uh, program planning and permitting authority uh, regarding federally threatened, endangered, or other protected species. Uh, states do have the authority to, and they often do, implement further conservation measures um, or state laws beyond what the Fish and Wildlife Service recommends. Um, states can also include additional non-federal species on state-specific protection listings um, and state threatened and endangered species, and their protection is usually regulated through um, state DNRs, DECs, or game offices. Um, since the Fish and Wildlife Service and the appropriate state offices are the primary information holders and regulators regarding protected species, uh, the National Park Service may communicate and consult with them during the compliance process for a North Country Trail project if it was appropriate. Um, and in those consultations, the Fish and Wildlife Service or the state might recommend uh, conservation measures for a specific project that aid in the protection and conservation of a protected species or their habitat. Um, I am focusing on the piping plover tonight, um, but Charlie had mentioned to me he wanted to hear a little bit about other um, protected species that might be in um, habitats that um, are either shared by the piping plover or could be near it. Um, so I did want to kind of briefly go over them just to show that the piping plover does not exist in isolation and there is a potential for protected species diversity in the Great Lakes region and North Dakota um, waterways. So on this slide, I have three federally threatened dune plants. Um, they, these plants are endemic to the Great Lake region um, and they all need dune shoreline or dune ad adjacent habitat to survive and grow. All three of these plants are found in Wilderness State Park in Michigan, um, and the pitcher's thistle is present at several other Great Lake areas in the lower and upper peninsula um, of Michigan. Um, on this side are federally protected wildlife that could share or be near habitats that the piping plover uses. The red knot is um, another migratory shorebird. It is listed as threatened. The red knot is somewhat uncommon in the Great Lakes region in North Dakota. It tends to prefer marine shorelines and habitats. And the Fish and Wildlife Service does have critical habitat for this bird proposed, although none of it is near the uh, North Country Trail. Another bird I have on here is the uh, whooping crane. The whooping crane is endangered in North Dakota and it is very rare. It does live in wetlands and marshes that could be near lakes that the piping plover uses. Um, and then the third bird I have on here is the bald eagle. The bald eagle is not listed as protected and in, or endangered, um, but it is federally protected under another legislation called the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, I like to include the bald eagle because it's very recognizable and it does have a potential presence in all of our North Country Trail states. And of course they do like to live near water. At the bottom here, I have both the gray wolf and the Canada lynx. Um, they are elusive protected mammals that prefer to live in forests in the UP of Michigan, as well as in Northern Minnesota and Wisconsin. They both have critical habitat in Superior National Forest. And then finally, I have the Northern long ear bat, which is another forest dwelling mammal. They have a very extensive habitat range and has the potential to be present in every North Country Trail state. They actually spend most of the year living in trees, not caves, generally from April through September. Um, I have previously done presentations on bats, so if you would like to learn more about protected bats, I encourage you to watch the recorded presentation I did last year that is on the association's um, YouTube page on protected species. And I chat a lot more about bats there. Um, so these are all other potential protected species that might be near the trail and the piping plover. So let's dive into the star of tonight's presentation, the piping plover. It is a small bird about robin sized, can be identified by their sandy colored feathers. They have a white belly and orange legs. 
Um, breeding adults have a short bill that is yellow and black with a black collar um, or bib around its neck, and they have a black band or almost like a unibrow between their eyes. Um, immature or non-breeding adults have a completely black bill and a white collar or bib around their neck. And um, I have a photo of both the breeding adult and the non-breeding adult on this slide. There are three different populations or subspecies of piping clover. We're gonna talk about um, two of those, the Great Lakes population and the Northern Great Plains population. Um, the third population is the Atlantic coast population, which is on the East Coast. And um, none of those habitat areas are near the North Country Trail. They're primarily um, marine ocean shorelines. So when considering areas that are on or near the NCT, um, the piping plover has these two general habitat areas. In the Great Lakes region, they tend to prefer wide, flat, open, sandy, or uh, gravelly cobble beaches. Um, they like to inhabit areas that have dunes or um, sparse vegetation. And in the Northern Great Plains, they prefer to use the shorelines of alkaline lakes and reservoirs. Um, and they also like to be on unvegetated river sandbars that are in a lake or um, a river. They have a potential presence in these habitats um, in North Dakota from about the new Rockford Canal to the NCT's Western terminus at uh, Lake Sacagawea State Park. And they do have um, designated critical habitat. If you remember from my definitions earlier, critical habitat is assigned by the Fish and Wildlife Service as habitat areas that are deemed vital for the conservation and management of the species. Um, so critical habitat areas that might be near the trail include a few areas in Michigan, um, some Lake Michigan shorelines between Petoskey and Harbor Spring, some of the beaches in Wilderness State Park, as well as the beaches and shorelines on Lake Superior between um, Grand Marius, I might have said that wrong, and Whitefish Point, so Superior Shoreline area. In Wisconsin, there's some critical habitat on Lake Superior um, near uh, on the Bad River Reservation. And then there's a small bit on the bays near the city of Superior, Wisconsin. <clears throat> and then finally in North Dakota, there's a very large critical habitat area around the Missouri River, Government Bay and Lake Audubon. And then they also have some small, um, just scattered critical habitat areas in other smaller lake complexes, such as the Turtle Lake area. Um, and those are pretty scattered and smaller critical habitat locations. Um, but piping plovers do not spend the entire year or their lives in the Great Lakes region or in the Northern Great Plains. They are migratory and they are snowbirds. So they like to winter in the south at the Gulf of Mexico or the coastline from Florida to the Carolinas. It's shown in blue on this map here, their winter locations. Um, during the winter, they don't do too much during the weather other than eating and fueling up for their migration journey. In the spring, they do begin their flight north to breed a nest. Um, they arrive to the Great Lakes and North Dakota in about uh, mid-April where they will breed, nest, and raise their young. Um, and then all of them, including the new immature birds, will leave the north to return to their winter locations in late August. Um, so about April to August is when they have the potential to be near the NCT. Um, piping plovers, while they are um, both at their winter locations and their northern locations, um, will eat small beach invertebrates that are close to the water's edge, like um, maybe worms or beetles, small crustaceans, snails. Um, they typically run very quickly along the water's edge, stopping frequently to lean down to peck and eat. Um, and they do have this really unique feeding behavior or technique that is called foot trembling. Um, essentially, they will put one foot in front and they will tap or slide it rapidly over the sand before bending over to peck. Um, ornithologists believe this behavior is meant to cause a vibration or a movement on the ground that startles the small invertebrates out from hiding under the sand so that, that they can find and eat them easier. 
And I do have a video of this behavior to show you. So let me um, bring that up so you can see what foot trembling looks like. I have to bring up a different screen for this, so bear with me. So you should all be seeing a YouTube video right now, right? Thumbs up. Yeah. Yeah, we see it. So this is the foot trembling, just quickly um, moving his foot over the sand, vibrating to get the small invertebrates to come out so he can eat them. And it's pretty um, unique technique, feeding technique. Oh, kind of funny. <laughs> All right. And I will bring back up the PowerPoint. Um, okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, piping plovers do migrate to the Great Lakes or the Northern Great Plains to breed and nest. Um, breeding starts with the males making the nest. Females will um, investigate the nest and then the males will try to attract them by fanning and fluffing their feathers. And they do this really um, entertaining, fast paced high kick. And I do have videos to show you of, of this um, high kick that they will do to attract the females. Assuming the female accepts the male's nest and his dance, she will usually lay three to four small speckled eggs. Um, both adults will incubate the eggs and raise the young equally together. They are monogamous for one season, often just laying one brood with one mate per season, and then often changing to a new mate in the next year when they migrate back. Um, Piping plover nests are very inconspicuous. They're just small depressions in the sand. Sometimes they're lined with pebbles or gravel. They're very well camouflaged, um, but they are typically out in the open because piping plovers prefer habitats that don't have a lot of vegetation. Sometimes they'll put their nests next to dune grass or other vegetation, but often they'll just make it out in the open sand above the high water mark. Um, but despite them making their nests out in the open, they are pretty territorial and protective of those nests. Piping plover pairs are not necessarily communal with other plovers and they will claim a nest territory for themselves for each pair. Um, although their ter territory may be pretty small, sometimes there might only be 50 feet or so in between two plover nests, um, but they will be very protective of that small area around their nest. Um, they will run along the border of their territory, um, often running in parallel with the plovers in the next territory. So they're both kind of running along their territory border. And I will show you a video of that as well. Um, it's their kind of way of saying this side of the line is mine and you cannot cross. And sometimes they do get aggressive with each other if they feel that the other plover is coming too far over to their side. Um, the piping plover also has an instinctual behavior to protect their nest from predators. So if a human or a predator is too close to the nest, the piping plover will feign an injury called the broken wing display. They will flap their wings pathetically, they'll bend their wing, make it look like that their wing is broken and they cannot fly. The idea is that a natural predator would be enticed to follow that adult away from the nest for what looks like an easy meal. Even a human might be enticed to follow that piping plover thinking, oh, I need to, I need to help this bird. Um, so I'm going to show you some videos of these behaviors so you can see what they look like. Um, the broken wing display is um, not very unique in the bird world, um, but some of them are unique to piping plovers and other shorebirds. The um, one website I have for videos is, um, hang on one second, oh, here it is.
this um, Great Lakes piping plover life history. They have a ton of videos of piping plover behaviors and life history. I'm not gonna be able to show all of them to you today, but if you ever wanna check this out to look at more videos of piping plover behavior, um, they have quite the collection and they're um, really engaging and, and fun to watch. So you can um, really get to know piping plover behavior. So here's a video of the um, parallel walk. You'll see um, two plovers from different pairs in different territories claiming that, that territory line with each other. So kind of an interesting behavior. <laughs> and if one of those would have crossed the invisible line, they might get aggressive with each other and um, fluff up their feathers and maybe even attack each other. Oh, he might have gone over the line. <laughs> um, here's some piping plovers in a territorial dispute. So someone made someone else angry, two pairs. Um, then this video has um, a male making a nest. Um, the tilt display is essentially the fluffing and fanning of feathers. You'll see a female come over to inspect the nest um, and then he'll do the, the high stepping to try to attract the female. So this is the male lying in the nest. The female's coming over to check it out. And he's starting to fan out his feathers. He's getting ready for his high kicks. <laughs> All right, and then that goes on for a while. Um, yeah, and um, there's no more videos on this page that I'm gonna show you, but there are a lot of them. So I definitely recommend checking this out on your own time if you're interested in looking at more piping plover behaviors. Um, and then I also have a video of the broken wing display. Uh, so a predator, uh, humans have gotten too close to its nest. So it's pretending to be distressed. Mm -hmm. So those are just some of the interesting behaviors of the piping plover. Um, and then on this slide, I just wanted to highlight how inconspicuous and camouflaged their nests can be. Even their chicks are very close to the sandy color. So they're pretty invisible and hard to spot if you're far away or if you're not looking for them. Um, and this inconspicuousness of their nest is part of the reason for their threatened population numbers. Um, so I think they're pretty easy to spot in the photos. This one's a little tricky. It's surrounded by rocks that look very similar to it. Um, yeah, so very, very hard to see out in the open. And um, this kind of leads me into the next part of this presentation, which is talking about their decline and threats. Um, so piping plover populations, as well as many migratory birds, first began experiencing 
um, a great decline in the 1800s and the early 1900s when birds were very, very popular for collection, decorative feathers, and hunting. Uh, they were not hunted just for food, but also for sport. Birds were popular for things like taxidermy, uh, scientific collection, and feathers were a huge fashion statement at the time. Women would put feathers and birds on their hats and on their clothes. Um, so people were just killing migratory birds for, for fashion. Um, so migratory birds were noticeably decreasing or going extinct, um, the passenger pigeon being one of the more well-known extinctions of this time. Uh, so this did lead to the passage of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 1918, which did prohibit the killing, collection, and selling of migratory birds and migratory bird parts. With the passage of this act, the piping plover did start to recover a little bit, but then after the end of World War II, um, there was an increase in shoreline development and beach recreation, which hit the recovering population with another major threat. So this all led to the piping plover being listed on the Endangered Species Act in 1986. The Great Lakes population was listed as endangered and the Northern Great Plains population was listed as uh, threatened. Um, so historically, piping plovers in the Great Lake regions were around 800 pairs per breeding season. And before their listing on the Endangered Species Act, their population had declined to just 12 pairs in the Great Lakes region uh, in 1984. So after being included on the act and with the increased protections and conservation, they did, um, they have been able to recover to about 70 pairs today in the Great Lakes. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service does have a recovery goal of 150 pairs for at least five consecutive years with an average of about two fledglings per pair. And it must also have the insured protection and maintenance of the habitat that can support those numbers. For the Northern Great Plains population, I could not find historical numbers for the plover in North Dakota, but I did find that there was about 300 nesting pairs in North Dakota at the time of its listing on the Endangered Species Act. Um, and then with the increase protections, they've been able to increase to about 700 pairs by 2008. Um, the recovery goal for um, the Great Northern Great Plains region is a, a bit different for the Fish and Wildlife Service. It's to have a um, stable or increasing population over 10 years with a projected steady or increasing population over the future 50 years as well as they have certain amounts in um, acres of suitable habitat that must be available in certain regional areas to support um, the population. So to meet recovery goals, it's not enough to have a continued increase in population numbers, but there also has to be the habitat to support those numbers for their best stability and longevity. Uh, so while their protection and populations have increased since being listed on the Endangered Species Act, the piping plover does still experience threats to its um, recovery. Continued habitat destruction or modification is a big one. Um, at the Great Lakes, it is primarily shoreline and recreational development. In, in North Dakota, it's primarily in-water development, um, like a dam, um, river channelization, or reservoirs. Um, and then it could also be industries that might be near or might use a waterway, such as uh, oil and gas or agriculture. Uh, predators are, of course, another threat. Um, some of their natural predators are things like gulls, raptors, ravens, crows, foxes, coyotes. Um, but when recreational and shoreline development increases, um, it also attracts an increased numbers of unnatural predators, such as raccoons, cats, and dogs. Um, and then water, of course, also attracts human recreation, so it's no surprise that recreational activities can also impact the piping plover. Uh, so these are activities such as swimming, beach walking, walking off trail, um, off-road vehicles, ATVs, uh, dogs being off leash, camping, fireworks, etc. anything you might do by the water. Um, because their nests are inconspicuous and also out in the open, recreators might not even realize when they are damaging or disrupting a nest. And then finally, I do have climate change on this list. Um, climate change is impacting many protected species worldwide. 
Um, in the case of the piping clover, shifts in temperature and moisture could have a profound effect on piping clover habitat particularly in North Dakota and the Northern Great Plains, their habitat is dependent on um, wet and dry cycles to keep their um, habitat free of vegetation. So if the level and types of vegetation change or if invasive vegetation is able to be introduced, the piping plovers might have a harder time finding their preferred open areas for breeding and nesting. Um, and again, recovery calls goals are not only an increase in population numbers, but also having those, the habitat that supports it. Um, so when we think about potential impacts of the piping clover from uh, North Country trail activities specifically, so beyond the overall threats and well, what, what, is, what could be a potential impact from the trail, this could be things like disturbance during their sensitive breeding and nesting time, such as from noise or human presence, um, direct or indirect nest damage, such as accidentally damaging a nest uh, during a trail project or indirectly causing some runoff or erosion that impacts the quality of their habitat. Um, changes to critical habitat would be another impact uh, to consider, such as directly placing trail in critical habitat area or indirectly causing invasive species to spread. And then finally, I have encountering the bird on the list, which could cause the piping plover distress. There are um, many broad overall conservation member measures that the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, other federal agency, and our land managers are doing to protect the piping plover. It could be things like putting exclusion fencing around the nests, um, banding and tracking work, or seasonally closing off certain beaches during piping plover nesting times. Uh, I do have a video to share here that talks about piping plover conservation partnerships. We of course are no stranger to partnerships for the protection and building of the trail. So I thought it was um, a good video to show how partnership is working successfully in protecting a species. So let me get this video up for you all. I'm Vince Cavalieri with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I am the Great Lakes Piping Plover uh, Recovery Coordinator. I basically uh, help coordinate the rest of the partners um, on the whole Great Lakes Piping Plover program uh, across uh, the whole Great Lakes Basin. My name is Francie Cuthbert, and I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities, and I've been studying piping plovers in the Great Lakes region since about the mid-1980s. My name is Ethan Scott. I am the piping plover crew lead here at Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. Uh, the Great Lakes piping plover is a federally endangered species, actually one of the most critically endangered species in the region. Um, and uh, because of that, you know, pretty much all the actions uh, involving Great Lakes piping plovers are run through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We started, when I say we, again, I'm talking about myself and graduate students, and we work um, very closely with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the uh, Michigan Department of Natural Resources and other agencies such as U.S. Forest Service, uh, National Park Service, um, as well as um, uh, some of the nonprofits in the state uh, to promote recovery. So, it, you know, it's a big team effort. The uh, Piping Plover Recovery Program is a major program here at Sleeping Bear Dunes. Um, we have approximately one-third of the nesting piping plovers in the Great Lakes region. The University of Minnesota runs a bird banding program and um, it makes our jobs as plover monitors a lot easier because we know uh, every breeding adult has a 
uh, individual identifiable band and so we know exactly where that bird is from and where there might be nesting now. Um, it also helps in wintering uh, sightings and so we know where that bird might go over winter. Um, the chicks all get an individual brood band and so we know what chicks belong to what brood from year to year and once they start breeding they get their own individual bands as well. We also have international partners. We work with uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service and uh, the state of Ontario uh, where we also have breeding uh, Great Lakes piping plovers now. I just wanted to emphasize how uh, much cooperation we have from partners throughout the region um, including, you know, like I mentioned, uh, Great Lakes tribes, uh, several different universities, uh, including the University of Minnesota, uh, University of Michigan, Lake Superior State uh, University, who help with captive rearing, um, monitoring, uh, research, uh, things like that. And we also have a great uh, network of volunteers who uh, volunteer across the Great Lakes at different sites um, and are an integral part of the program as well. watching that with me. I thought it was a great example of how um, it's a team effort and um, something that we are very familiar with um, on the North Country Trail. So um, that was kind of the, the broader, bigger conservation efforts that are happening, but um, what can we do at the North Country Trail level? How can we avoid or greatly reduce potential impacts to the piping plover from trail activities specifically? Uh, so awareness and education is a big one. Um, I hear this a lot from the Fish and Wildlife Service, just simply having awareness about the piping plover, its status, its habitat is a fantastic conservation tool. Uh, knowledge is power as the saying goes. So I hope that we're partially doing that today with this presentation. Um, another thing we can do at the trail level is respecting piping plover signage and beach clo closures and encouraging others to. Uh, signs might say things like the beach is closed from April through August. Um, it might say that dogs must be leashed or that they're not allowed. Um, this photo here is what signs in Wilderness State Park and some other Michigan DNR lands look like. So it gives a little bit of education and then it tells you what, um, what you can do. And then I do have the compliance process on this list. When um, trail projects are submitted to the trail project form, it allows the National Park Service to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service about the piping plover when it's necessary. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service is the piping plover expert and the best resource for working out what specific conservation measures you might be able to employ for any one um, project. And then finally, we can respond appropriately if we were to ever see a piping plover or its nest during trail work. If you were to see a piping plover doing um, the broken wing display, the best thing to do would be to turn around and leave the area or to, um, you could also give the piping plover a really wide berth going towards the water since they nest above the high water mark. Um, making sure you're walking really, really carefully and looking closely at the ground while you're doing so. So that make sure there's no nests in your path. Um, and then here at our office, we have what I like to call the uh, stop lock hold procedures. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that on the next slide. Um, if you've ever communicated with me about conservation measures, then you might've seen this from me. Project work should stop and the MPS notified on the rare chance that a threatened or endangered species is inadvertently discovered during construction. Um, so if you accidentally see one during dis um, trail construction, um, you should immediately and safely stop work on the project and then um, lock the discovery in place by leaving it where it is, essentially do not disturb it. 
You can take a photo if it was safe to do so and it would not stress the bird. Um, and then you can get a hold of myself at the NPS as soon as possible. You could call me, you could email me. Um, this allows me to contact the Fish and Wildlife Service about the sighting. They like to document the occurrences. And then um, if it was necessary, we could communicate with them if there was any additional conservation measures we should consider before returning to work on the project. Um, your land manager might want to know about the sighting as well, depending on who they So that is all I have for tonight. I want, do want to open it up for um, q and I'm going to stop the recording so you can feel free to ask any questions just without having to worry about being recorded.